I think that to achieve equity in a classroom, I think we first need to think about what does an equitable classroom look like? How, how would I know one when I see one, right? Um, realizing also that equity, classroom equity, can be seen or measured on a continuum, so that some classrooms are more equitable than others. Um, and we strive for more and more and more equity. Um, so one of the features of an equitable classroom is that all students have access to quality curriculum, intellectually challenging tasks, uh, equal status interaction uh, with their peers, with the teachers, and with the text of schools. And by text of schools, I mean the books, the manipulatives, you know, text writ large. A classroom where the students can see each other as competent, as contributing, as learning, um, as colleagues and as peers, while engaging in serious content, is for me the ideal. They solve problems that are like real life problems. They address dilemmas. Uh, they have things to talk about. And they do that democratically, and they do that equitably. Um, that's, that's the ultimate. Now, I think that what, what people sometimes mistake it for is friendliness. Okay, so um, because, you know, group work is seen as the answer, <laughs> we do see classrooms that are, that classrooms that use group work are indeed friendlier because kids know each other's names. Uh, they talk to one another a little bit more. But that still does not address the issue of the equal status interaction. And so they can be friendly, but they don't necessarily see particular students as competent, as smart, and therefore can't see them as contributing to them or contributing to the group task. The theoretical basis for, for complex instruction in particular, comes from a theory called expectation state theory, expectation and status characteristic theory. Status characteristics um, are um, characteristics uh, where society agrees that it is better to be in the high state than in the low state, right? So society agrees or society knows that it is probably be better to be rich than poor <laughs> um, in certain societies uh, more power and prestige is related to the high status characteristic if you're white than if you're a person of color um, gender is such a diffuse status characteristic, right? So, so more power and prestige uh, in certain situations are given to males then. And, and there are many other, you know, age sometimes, or um, it's interesting. Uh, then the theory talks about specific status characteristics that are specific for a particular situation. In classrooms, particularly elementary classrooms, your perceived reading ability is such a status characteristic. What's so amazing is a research done in, in uh, um, I think, the late 70s, Susan Rosenholz, where kids, fourth graders, were asked to rank each other and themselves on their reading ability in classrooms. It's mind boggling, but the kids were able to rank themselves, and their ranking corresponded to the teacher's ranking to an amazing degree. And the theory also talks about something called status generalization, so that when I come to a situation and all I know about is that you're a good reader, 
and the task that we have to do has nothing to do with reading. We should build something. You know, a model airplane with Legos. I will still generalize from the fact that you're a good reader to your competence to building, for example. When teachers explain to the students that the task requires multiple intellectual abilities, uh, so a particular task, uh, you need to make sure that you understand the text, you talk about the ideas, you summarize them in ways that make sense, you can explain it to them, uh, you can synthesize, you can then make a visual representation of the poem that you read, you know, build a, a, a paint a beautiful painting out of it. Um, that, that that particular task then requires so many different things to do uh, that number one, a single person would will have a hard time doing it by themselves in 25 and a half minutes. Uh, and so I need everybody and I need everybody's expertise. Okay. And that really no one person is always successful at everything, which is a huge problem by the way for the kids who are always successful at everything in schools because the tasks are so narrow, which is why they are successful. But on these multidimensional, you know, broad, rich tasks, I need many different ways of being smart, many different ways. Um, so we are, um, you know, Howard Gardner talks about multiple intelligences, and it's, it's great work. And sometimes I want to say that probably the single most important thing that he did was that he made intelligence plural. He made intelligences, you know, so it's not only one. So just adding an S to the end of the word was like perfect for me. Um, so no, that's number one, to, to just make the kids aware that different kinds of uh, capabilities and strengths and talents that we can contribute that come from school but also from our outside experiences. Kids come to school with such rich repertoires that we never take advantage of, we never mind, we never give them opportunities to show how smart they are, and they are incredibly smart. So that's what, making it aware. Then, when the students are actually working on these tasks, and they require the multiple ability tasks, uh, uh, multiple abilities to, to perform them, or mul you know, different ways of being smart, I like to say that that way because it's so much more colloquial. Um, then, as a teacher, I can go around and observe and give specific feedback to all students, particularly to the students who have never before been seen by their peers as contributors or as smart. Okay. And so I'm changing expectations. Because if I say more and more, hey, you know, wow, look at him. Look at what he did. That's changing expectations. Uh, and so when I enter a new situation, I won't automatically say, oh, this person is going to be the one who's going to solve the problem, and I can just sit back and, you know. But we all have, uh, we will all have to perform and, and do something to produce the task, to produce the product. I think that the message that, that we are trying to give is counter-normative for schools where everything is so narrow. It's counter-normative for teachers and it's counter-cultural in many ways. Uh, we are always wanting to find the best person in the whatever stupid measure we have for the, yeah, right? Um, and here it's more about, let's look at the richness. Now, the good thing about all of this is that in the end, actually, the writing, the reading and the writing, and all those test-taking skills that the kids have to perform on, are, are indeed there. You know, it's a false dichotomy that you say, well, if I have a rich task and I teach them all these higher order thinking and, you know, deep conversations, they won't do well on the test. But that's not true. That's a false dichotomy. That really is a false dichotomy. I started with saying, what do equitable classrooms look like? 
Okay, and I said all kids work on academically rich curriculum. Uh, both the teacher and all the kids uh, understand that they will have opportunity to demonstrate their smarts in different ways, by different means, on different occasions. Okay. They understand that being smart can be learned, that it's incremental and multidimensional. And finally, in an equitable classroom, and I know that that's where I get the most um, resistance is also probably lack of understanding, is that the achievement is clustered around a narrow, acceptable mean, and that there are very few kids who are just below and some kids who are above. Okay. So it's not a normal curve. The achievement in an equitable classroom is not the normal curve. Because in the normal curve, only 60% of the classroom are around the acceptable mean. I talk about achievement where I demonstrate what students know, what all students know, right, in, in this uh, graph. Uh, standardized test, actually, if an item does not discriminate, right, if you have some, an item that everybody knows how to respond to, that, that is taken out of the standardized test because it does not discriminate, right? Because we have to have a normal curve. The teachers that I work with and, you know, my step teachers who are these amazing people, they should go out and make a difference in that way and build equitable classrooms. That's, that's our job because, you know, if we don't do that, democracy won't be there.